Got it. Okay. Our, our hidden codes. Is that a secret code? Yeah, that was the hidden codes. <laughs> okay. It's for the reading of the verses. <laughs> okay, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we open up in prayer um, before we get started here? So, Father God, you know, Father, is studying your word, Father, it's just amazing to me and how as we study your book of Revelation, that it's telling us about things that are yet to happen, Father. And Father, it's amazing that when we study your word through the whole word, that there's so much of the word that when it was originally written, it was looking in the future. And as we're sitting here today, we get to look at it as history, Father. And we get to see the, the revelations that you provided and then what actually happened as a result of it. And it gives us a, a peace and a comfort to know that your, your word is a guide, it's a tool. It's something that helps us as we navigate through life, Father. And I'm just thankful for that. And I just pray that with tonight's scripture, with chapter 17, Father, it's complicated. So just please give us all wisdom to try to shed light into what your word has to say and, and to reveal to us so we discern what you want us to know at this stage in history. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. So... We are getting ready to start and enter into chapter 17, chapter 17. You know, it is interesting, you know, we, a couple weeks ago now, actually it's three weeks ago, we finished chapter 16, and tonight and next week, we're going to hit a concept of Babylon, is what the actual objective here is to, tonight and next week as well, and Babylon has actually been a, a town or a city that's mentioned throughout the Bible. In fact, in Revelation, it's already been mentioned a couple times, once in Revelation chapter 16 and the other in Revelation chapter 14. And really what it's declaring in those verses that Babylon's going to fall and its fall has been declared. And so in Revelation 14, in verse 8, it says that another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, is fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So it's like, wow, okay. So that hit us back in chapter 14, talking pretty badly about Babylon. And then in, in last chapter we went through, Revelation 16, verse 19, it said that now the great city, talking about Babylon, was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup, of the wine of the uh, fierceness of his wrath. So in both cases, we see this very negative connotation related to Babylon. And so what we're gonna learn here in the next two chapters in 17 and 18 is this fall of Babylon, we're gonna actually see more uh, carefully detailed description of what's actually going to be happening here. And just from a big picture, Babylon itself is actually mentioned uh, in the scriptures almost 300 times. Uh, 287 times the city of Babylon is mentioned in the Old and New Testament. So it's actually the most, uh, it's the city most mentioned other than one. And that one city is Jerusalem. Only Jerusalem is measured, men, mentioned more times than Babylon. And it was a literal city. It was a city in, in what we think of as a rock now. We learn about it the first time uh, back in Genesis chapter 11. Um, Babylon was considered to be the capital of the empire that captured, uh, conquered Judah. Um, the Jews themselves actually saw Babylon as really the essence of all evil and the enemy of God, God's people. So when you think about Jerusalem on one, on one side of the aisle, you should be thinking about Babylon as the other side of the aisle. And that'll come out very loudly tonight as we go through the scriptures. So what we're going to see when we get into chapter 17 and 18 is we're going to see uh, two Babylons, actually. Uh, and we're also going to see that tied into the Antichrist reign. So in chapter 17, the first view of that Babylon we're going to see is the religious Babylon. We're going to see it as an apostate church as we study chapter 17 tonight. And then next week when we study chapter 18, we're going to see a different view of Babylon, and that's the commercial Babylon. And so what will be interesting as we study through the scriptures here today to think about today's world system 
and how the how the world itself that we're seeing today actually is going to converge on some of these descriptions that we're going to see in the scriptures here in, in 17 and 18. You know, and I've said this in other times as well, and I'll just say it again very briefly, that there's a lot of different views on what this scripture means, and I'm going to try my best. This chapter, I have to be candid, is pretty complicated, um, and I'm going to try my best to try to, to weave it out and give you a couple different options in terms of what the various scenarios mean. And I'll give you at least what my view is, but in no way, shape, or form is going to be a strong, strong view. But I think plausible at some level. You know, it's often said that, uh, you know, even though it's a short chapter, particularly tonight in chapter 17, you know, it really does have some tantalizing information. Uh, and the number of commentaries and the variety of commentaries that we've seen in it, it's, it's very broad. One description I saw of it said this, it said, we may have see it as a riddle wrapped up inside a puzzle, but tonight we'll try to unpack it. So you ready to dig into it a little bit? Let's see what it has to say. So we're gonna start with verses one and two. Uh, Nina, if you wouldn't mind taking those, we're gonna talk about the great harlot. Okay. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come and I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of the earth have become drunk. Boy, that's a very uplifting set of verses you just read, wasn't it, Nina? Um, we, 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 but we get here in verse one, as Nina just read, we, we see this phrase, depending on what your, your, um, your, um, version your bible version says something along the lines of judgment of the harlot so this judgment of the harlot it reveals to us that as we read through this we should have no doubt uh, about the fate and the ultimate failure of what ultimately is going to happen here in in these couple chapters that we re read now i've already mentioned babylon many times and we're going to learn that this harlot that nina was just reading about is considered the religious babylon It'll get revealed to us a little bit more in a couple verses, but if I overuse Babylon, if you don't actually see it in the scriptures yet, trust me, it's coming in terms of what's going to be covered here. And so if you think about this, though, Babylon itself actually preceded Christianity by many, many, many years. It actually is an integral part of many of the Old Testament scriptures that exist in the Bible. We can find it in Ezekiel, where... Uh, Ezekiel protests against the ceremony of weeping for uh, Tammuz, and I'll tell you who that is in just a second. Or Jeremiah mentions the heathen practice of making cakes for the queen of heaven uh, or offering incense to the queen of heaven, all pointing to and referring to uh, Babylon. That's uh, mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 7 and chapters 44. So according to history and legend, uh, the Babylonian religion began with Nimrod, Nimrod's right, wife, and his wife's name was Semiramis. Uh, and now Nimrod, just for a point of trivia, uh, was actually the great-grandson of someone very, very popular or very well-known in the Bible, and that was Noah. So if you recall, when the flood was, was settled down, you know, the eight people that were came off the ark, they all, all went and, and created offspring and repopulated the earth. Well, the great grandson later, one of the the uh, the descendants was Nimrod. And another point of trivia, Nimrod's name literally means we will rebel. That's what his name means. And it's a great characterization of who he is. But he had a wife and his wife was Semiramis. And she was a high priestess and she was focused on idol worship. And she actually gave birth to a son. His name was Tammuz. And, and she claimed that he was conceived miraculously, and Tammuz was actually considered to be a savior. It was also said that her son was killed by a wild beast and then miraculously brought back to life. See any parallels here in terms of what we're learning from the other parts of the scripture? Um, and Baal, uh, Baal, uh, was a local Canaanite name for the Babylonian Tammuz, uh, the son of of Nimrod. So as we dig deeper, 
and we'll find chapter 17 that isn't really about the harlot per se, but it is about uh, uh, it is about a kingdom, a kingdom of Babylon that we're going to be talking about. But let me talk a little bit more about this harlot. We're going to learn a little bit later in Revelation chapter uh, 17, verse 15, that this harlot sits on many waters or presides over many nations. So we're going to find that this person is, is a, has a global reach and presence, has this universal kind of international character, and we'll learn that many peoples and nations come under her spell and likely under her sovereignty as well. And she seems to be able to unify um, there's all kinds of religions that, that even today, there's all kinds of religions and, and many religions that we have along the world today are false religions, but somehow this harlot is able to unify them, uh, unify this, these worldwide religions, and it even includes those um, offshoots of, of uh, being a Protestant, offshoots of being a uh, Catholic. I mean, anyone that is a false religion, this, this harlot seems to be able to bring them together. and. A term that's often used is an apostate. An apostate is someone who is once believed and then rejects the truth of God. So this harlot is going to be able to bring apostates together, these people that are, are now navigating and gravitating towards her. And so the scripture goes on to say the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk. And so it's telling us that this, this religious side of Babylon is actually intoxicates kings and people. Uh, Karl Marx actually had a famous stating, statement, and it's partly right when he said, religion is the opiate of the masses. I'm going to twist that around a little bit and say, yep, he was partly right because empty religion is the opium of the masses. And that's what we're going to see here from the harlot. And it also says that uh, they were made drunk with the wine of their fornication or immorality or idolatry. Uh, that depending on your, your Bible translations, it could have said one of those uh, three words or maybe something else. But since this harlot is connected to this well-accepted religious system that's not Christianity, it's likely to appear as something that's really attractive and actually spiritual, though it doesn't necessarily have to be moral. We're not given what the details of this particular world religion is. But we learn that this harlot has actually lured uh, leaders uh, of these nations away from, from, from our God, the worship and obedience to, to the one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jason, Jacob, and actually worshiping and following these non-gods. And oftentimes these non-gods can go by another name, also you know, be considered as idols, where people f don't even focus on any God, but they focus on riches or wealth or possessions, or maybe in forbidden pleasures. They take their focus off uh, the ruler of the universe and put their focus on things that, that really aren't right or aren't, aren't real. So with what I've said so far, let me summarize for a moment where we're really at. So here, what we're seeing here in just these first two verses, we're seeing the opposite of something that's godly. We're seeing Babylon and this harlot, they're empowered by Satan, and they're the source of evil. And what is evil? When I talk about evil, what do I mean by that? What I really am talking about is everything that God is against. Whatever is God's character, Satan and the harlot are against it. They're the opposite of it. The harlot by nature is impure. The harlot is unclean. She contaminates others with impurity. She's actually, as we're going to learn in the scripture, she's contagious in a, in a, in a non-flattering way. So chapter 17, as we continue going through this, is going to reveal a series of actions, but we all should see them as metaphors that depict this kind of international mocking and mimicking of God. And it really, in a way, reverses the image of the God that we expect as we see it revealed here. Any comments or questions about those first couple verses? Well, kind of as a as a different, uh, not maybe different, but as a slightly different, well, different viewpoint on evil represented in these first two verses. It's the it's the perversion of the good that God has created. It mm. talks specifically about sex and wine, both of which are um, good things that God have created that these people have corrupted so vilely, you know, um, 
but it's it's um it's initially the goodness of God that's that's being corrupted. You know, I actually like your description better than mine because it does it does twist around the fact that what God has made good here we see getting twisted to evil or wrong. I think that's very good, Nina. I appreciate that. I think that's actually better because it extracts out um, what can happen to what's been made good and how it can be misused into bad, you know, when it's being led that way. Good comment. Any other thoughts? Uh, <clears throat> maybe it's much less insightful, but when I was a kid growing up, Nimrod was a curse, something you called stupid people. Oh, that's interesting. It was actually like a four-letter word? Uh, no, it was more like idiot or idiot. Or, okay. And I don't know where that came from, but that was something we used a lot. You know, I'm curious. Does anyone else have that kind of use of that, that word? I've, okay. I've heard it as well, too. Yeah. That's interesting. My writer still uses it. Who uses it? My wife, all the time. <laughs> Not on me. <laughs> not on you or on you not on me all right good good that's good to hear <laughs> all right so let's go on to verses three through six and denise if you wouldn't mind taking those that'd be great sure so the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness there i saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns and blasphemes against God were written all over it. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand, she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. A, myster a mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities of the world. I see... I'm sorry, I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I start, sorry, I stared at her in complete amazement. Mm. I mean, there's actually a lot here, but it's interesting because what we learn as, as Denise started the reading here is that the angel is actually carrying John away into the wilderness. That's how the setting starts up, starts up here. And it's kind of an appropriate setting for the vision that's about ready to be depicted. And we learn here that this harlot actually rides the same beast that we read about in Revelation 13, the, set, the same beast with seven heads and 10 horns. And if you recall back then, we described and characterized that beast as the Antichrist. So here the harlot is sitting on the, the Antichrist, on the beast with seven heads and 10 horns. And so this tells us a couple things. Number one, it tells us that the harlot is supported by the beast power, the political power, the influence that the beast had. And it also suggests that she has a dominant role and at least outwardly controls and directs the beast. And we'll learn some more about that as we dig into it deeper. But we also see a contrast as she is associated with blasphemy as it's seen, seen from God's perspective. But we're gonna learn even more that from the people on earth, the people that are witnessing this, she will actually look quite religious and have a, in air quotes, I'll say, a faith that everybody wants. She's going to be very enticing uh, to those that actually see her. But now it describes some characteristics about her in terms of, of what she's wearing. And it had, talks about um, she was a dress or she wore uh, emblems of luxury, a purple of gold with precious stones and, star and scarlet. And so when you think about the colors of purple and scarlet, those were actually rare and costly um, dyes um, that represented colors of splendor or magnificence or authority or wealth. And, and those colors were often worn by Roman rulers. And then you had these precious stones and pearls. And the thing to keep in mind about that is though they may seem like that they're genuine, but you can actually use these as facades for a genuine, you know, heartfelt religion. Uh, Matthew 25, uh, 23, 25 and 26 say this. If you recall the scripture, it says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, exclamation point. This is Jesus talking. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. 
blind Pharisee, first cleans, cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside of them may be clean also. So here we see this, this depiction of this harlot that's sitting on the beast and the majesty of what she's wearing and the jewels that she's having. And we have to watch for the hypocrisy that Jesus would reveal in, in Matthew 23. And even if we look at the gold cup that's depicted here, if you recall, when we were at the last seven, uh, the trumpet, the bowl seals, um, that mocks the use of God's bowls, which were also made of gold. So here we see this contrast here. So what is the cup filled with that we read about in here? It's filled with obscene and filthy things that have uh, been produced uh, by the harlot. Oh, but the name. It says on her forehead, a name was written. And so the name itself actually identifies her in more ways than one. Now, in Roman times, at this time, Roman prostitutes frequently wore a headband with their name actually engraved upon it. Um, actually, if you recall in Romans, I'm sorry, in Revelation uh, chapter 12, we learned of another woman, uh, the other woman that represented Israel when we saw the description of the characters back in chapter 12. This woman, though, represents an idolatrous false religion, as we're learning about. And it's another one of those contrasts that we see over and over in the book of Revelation. Hey, so what Rick. does it mean that the beast was filled with blasphemous names that the scripture says? So if you go to the Hebrew context of what names means, it's the idea about a, a person's character or a person's attributes. So by filled with blasphemous names, we're talking about you know, poor character, poor attributes, it's what's being described here. But then we have the name. Oh, I'm sorry, Nina, were you going to say something? I'll, I'll wait till you finish because I'll let, because it's kind of tangential. Okay, okay. Um, so let's go to the name here. It's so the name, uh, in, at least in my translation, it says mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. And I saw that most translations didn't have that first word mystery, but the New King James Version does. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, translate that, that description, and I'm gonna say it this way, that what this is talking about is it's talking about this, it's a spiritual, this mystery is a spiritual representation. It's a spiritual representation, which is the source, it's the mother, it's the source of all idolatry all abominations, and the spiritual idolatry, the harlots. That is what this, this description is saying. It's a mystery representation, which is the source of all idolatry and spiritual adultery. Oh my, what a name to be put on the forehead of your head. And I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but when we read about the Bible overall, we can actually see the Bible almost being the tale of two cities because two cities pop up over and over again. We have Jerusalem, as we talk about, as the most mentioned city, and then Babylon being the second most mentioned city, the city of rebellion. And then finally, we see this, the drunk with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So this woman not only persecutes, but she also revels in her persecution of the, of the godly as drunk, revels in wine is how the scripture says and so this uh this wasn't like a pagan persecution that was well known in john's day but this is more of a religious error and persecution we can also call it like a pseudo church is what this harlot represents where a false religion is always the worst enemy always fighting against what the true religion is but here it ends with an interesting comment it says John marvels with great amazement. It's an interesting choice of terms. You know, John is said here to have greatly wondered or was astounded or marveled, depending on what your translation is. And, and the Greek word for that is thalma. And he, he's marveling at this woman with great amazement. Now, what it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that he was puzzled. It doesn't mean that he was confused. And it doesn't mean that he was worried. It's a more positive term. It actually indicates kind of a, 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 an admiration. We might even say wonderful. So John here seems to be impressed by what he sees, not disgusted. 
uh, which is very interesting. He was he was as bedazzled by this amazing splendor, you know, of this harlot who's riding on the beast. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that perspective as we get a little bit deeper uh, into the scripture tonight. But uh, Nina, what, what did you want to follow up with? Well, the description of her clothing is very close to the description of the clothing of the priests in the Old Testament. Mm. And I think that's a parallel of what you were saying. This is a false religion. It's going to have a lot of... Um, of uh, seeming characteristics of, of, of the true faith in God. And it's going to be bedazzling and, and, and people will have to be able to look beyond it. But these descriptions of the purple, scarlet, gold, jewels, pearls, everything is, um, is, is very uh, similar to the priest's um, adornment of, of, the, of the temple, of the uh, tabernacle and temple. What's interesting about what you said as well, it was several weeks ago, we had a discussion here, and it was it was about along the lines of, hey, with all this deception and everything going on during Revelation, those people that are here on earth that are experiencing of it, are they going to be fooled by it, right? And it kind of goes to what your point was, Nina, is this false religion that's coming here, it's going to be enticing, and it's going to be convincing. And what's interesting is, we, just, we stopped at verse 6, but even at verse 6, we see John, who's experiencing this by a vision, is bedazzled by it. I mean, he's he's attracted to it. Um, and then we'll learn a little bit more about that. But I think your point is well taken, that this false religion isn't something that you just can, you know, it's going to be enticing. It's going to be convincing in some manner that we don't really understand. Um, as as we opened up this chapter, I kind of thought about Proverbs. Now, Proverbs starts with, you know, son, heed my words. That leads into wisdom. That leads into listen to wisdom. She's beckoning from the streets. Then it moves into there's a seductress woman hmm. that will lure you off the path. That will lure you away from the city. And, you know, and that's just in the first the first two proverbs so like and the other thing that i've heard at one time that wisdom the hebrew word for wisdom or the hebrew concept of wisdom is not just knowledge or smarts or intelligent but it's battle plans it's how to acquire wealth it's like the gamma is way broader than how we view it and so um anyway just interesting yeah i actually think that's true because we it, when we try to make knowledge and wisdom synonyms, I think we're understating wisdom. Because really, I think stated a little bit differently than what you said, I think of wisdom as an application of knowledge. It's applying it. You know, it's it, there's a practical applications for it in terms of how you apply for battle plans or for how to invest or or, or decisions to make, right? It's more than the knowledge. It's a good comment. Um, and th this is more of a historical reference, but there is a modern day correlation. When you're reading that, that reminded me of, if you've ever heard of the Countess of Bathory, mm -mm. Who, was, who was known to sacrifice maidens sent to her court and bathe and drink their blood in an attempt to remain youthful. Okay. In the last few years, a company came up that harvests blood from young people and infuses it into older people that pay the price. Hmm. Let's see the, the comment here. It says, this reminds me of when Kane West started creating his pseudo Christian show. And a lot of people started following until he started proclaiming himself a little G it's amazing in how we can be enticed. And, and I think it's also amazing in how the enticing um, can get amplified as our world drifts away from God. <clears throat> yep, a lot of little G's around here, I think. Okay, so we're ready now to go into uh, verses 7 through 11. That's Jasmine. 
Jasmine, Jasmine, if you wouldn't mind taking me through those, please, that'd be great. I will do my best. It's a little right. complicated. <laughs> but the no, I'm going to ask you to explain them to me when you're done, just so you know. Wink, wink. No, that that I'm leaving that to you. All right, all right. <laughs> but the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the women, woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. Okay, that made a lot of sense to me. What does everyone else think? We good? All right, let's go to verse 12. Just kidding. All right, so what I'm going to do here tonight, because I, I do have to be candid, I've spent a lot of time on these particular verses to try to wrap my head around it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through um, these verses kind of top level and just kind of give an overview of them. And then I'm going to, I'm going to, going to give you um, several scenarios of what these verses actually mean. And I'll tell you which one I think is the closest to right. Um, but I'm gonna, not going to give you those scenarios till we get a little bit deeper in the scripture to get a little bit more context beyond what Jasmine just read. All right, so going back to verse 7. So we see here that the angel, the focus of the explanation is on the beast. It's not on the harlot here. And it appears that the harlot actually ruled or rode on the beast. And if you recall, the beast is the Antichrist, or the Antichrist system. And so the beast here is the dynamic factor and using the harlot as her tyrant uh, from a religious perspective and keeping in mind that the way this religion is being used is really as a tool to accomplish some purposes that will be revealed a little bit later on. And so initially back in verse, verse three, the woman rides the beast, but here a little subtlety, it says the beast carries the woman. It's a small, you know, maybe an important change in terminology of the Antichrist using this false religious system to serve his own agenda. It was a subtle comment I saw in one of the commentaries that I thought was interesting. But then we transition into verse 8. There's a key insight um, that, that it gets revealed here. And this is the angel now trying to, to um, calibrate John. So recall that... Before Jasmine started, when we finished verse six, John sees this incredible, beautiful, uh, incomparable sight that he's witnessed in the harlot. Uh, and he had to be brought back to reality by the angel is what Jasmine just read. So think about this. And we kind of talked about it a minute ago of how people that are here during the Revelation time frame, how non-believers, they're going to be flabbergasted. They're going to be impressed and welcoming what's going to be happening at this particular time. John has an advantage. John's advantage is the angel through this vision is revealing to him who the woman really is. And when the time comes, there's going to be others who aren't going to have that advantage. And they will be taken in by what's happening here that we read in, in, uh, in Revelation. And so these, these abilities and this charisma, this likability, this leadership that we're going to see here, are, are unmatched, um, and people will gladly are going to do the will of the beast, believing that if he thinks something is best, it can't be challenged. So that's the, we, we have to keep in mind here that, you know, we think about this in terms of imagery, but when we actually see it in real life, when this really happens, it's going to be really appealing uh, to those that are living within it. And in verse 9, John gets a little bit more info uh, with this caveat that wisdom will be needed to understand. And it kind of goes to Denise's point that she just made a couple minutes ago, 
that we have to keep this in mind that wisdom by definition is from God. Knowledge, it can be acquired by anyone of reasonable, reasonable intelligence, but really when you have the insight of the Lord, that's when you can truly have deep wisdom. Now, I'm going um, we're, to we're, get a little bit into these the mountains and these characteristics here. Many quickly associate the description here of seven mountains in verse 9 with Rome and, and the Roman Catholic Church, because Rome is well known as the city on seven hills. That's what it's known as. But literally, the Greek word that's used here means mountains and not hills. Some will actually claim this is an uh, irrefutable um, uh, commentary or belief on that. As we learn a little bit later, I don't think that's correct. Uh, because in the Bible, mountains are sometimes also used to represent figures of government. We can learn that back in Daniel chapter 2. And, and like I said, the city of Rome is actually built on hills, not built on mountains. But we'll dig into that a little bit after we get through verse 12. Verse 10 talks about, you know, these seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other, and the other has not yet come. But when he comes, he must continue a short time. I'm going to go into that breakdown in fairly good detail that I hope I can make it very understandable. Um, and it's clearly a hard passage, so I don't want to diminish that at all uh, in terms of what that mean, means. But it probably has something to do with, in John's day, uh, looking at uh, world empires that were known up to that time and world empires that will come following that. And like I said, I'll dig into that a little bit deeper in just a few minutes. But finally, there's a, a key statement here that's going to create some trouble for us, even as we get through the uh, scenarios. And that's this a statement that says, when he comes, he must continue a short time. And it's unknown what short time actually means. How much time is that? And that'll become more uh, evident and why that's a problem as I go into the, the scenarios. And so finally, in verse 11, um, we learn of the this beast, and it's talking about the eighth. And we know the eighth comes from the seventh, and uh, is going to perdition. And perdition here means destruction, it means that the beast ultimately is going to be destroyed, um, that we'll actually learn as we get into later chapters of Revelation itself. So I know that was still a little bit cryptic. I'm going to go into more detail into scenarios, but does anyone have any uh, comments before we get into verses 12 through uh, 15? So Joe, if you wouldn't mind taking that, we're going to talk about 10 kings to come and allies of the Antichrist, 12 through 15. <clears throat> <clears throat> And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind and give over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, uh, sorry, and the lamb will conquer them. So he is lord of lords, king of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. Okay. All right, so we see these 10 kings who have received no kingdom as of yet. It probably alludes to a 10-nation confederation. Uh, we actually had a little bit of discussion of this a couple weeks ago. Um, it kind of points to the toes that are in Daniel chapter 2, the, the Nebuchadnezzar image of the, the statue, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But it also says here that these are of one mind. And so some see this as maybe part of the European Union, this, this group of 10. And I'll give you a couple different uh, ways to think about that. But ultimately, it says, the waters which you saw, here the harlot sits. So it really is telling us here, this harlot that we've been talking about, it's presiding over all the people, the multitudes of nations, and the tongues. So we have to look at this as a global phenomenon. And it tells us that this harlot really does have a worldwide influence through this connection with the beast through the antichrist we kind of think of this as a one world religion that is being developed that is to the antithesis of what christianity is and the interpretation of the harlot focuses on her relation to the beast 
she is connected to the beast and to the government. You know, if it kind of seems unthinkable, you know, re remember that throughout history, you know, religion, not true Christianity, has often been the willing servant and tool used by tyrants throughout history. It's often happened. Okay, so with that, I'm going to now talk about, I'm going to see if I can do this real quick. I did it spontaneously, so hopefully it'll, it'll work. Uh, hang on. Let's see here. All right, so do you see a little uh, depiction there of verses 7 through 12? And I have, can you see, you can't see my screen at all? No? Uh, participants can now see your screen. Now can you see my screen? Okay. And so as I'm talking through, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you uh, four different interpretations of what we've just read, what it might mean. And I'm going to be talking about these various verses. And the key parts of these various verses in verse 7, we're talking about seven heads and ten horns. I'm kind of going to try to describe what that means. Verse 9 talks about seven heads being seven mountains. I'm going to try to tie it all together. Verse 10 says seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. I'm going to bring that in there as well. Verse 11, talking about the eighth, which is a follow-up a follow from the seventh. And then finally, the ten horns and the ten kings. So I'm going to try. I've been working hard on this to try to, uh, to be able to communicate this in a manner that can make it some sense. Here's the first scenario. The first scenario that what these verses actually mean is it's all about Rome. It's all about Rome in John's day. What do I mean? Based on Rome's description as the city of seven hills, the seven heads actually represent Rome, is what the belief is, the Roman Empire. In the Old Testament, uh, mountains or hills represent governments, and that could uh, relate to Roman empires, but which seven Roman empires? Well, there's a couple lists that come to mind. The seven emperors could be Augustus and Tiberius and, and Cla uh, Caligula and Claudius and Nero. These are all emperors that are around the time frame of when John wrote the book of Revelation. The, that, that was five I just mentioned. The sixth one would be someone named Ves, uh, Vespasian. Um, but that's probably not right because Vespasian, uh, Passion, uh, actually ruled before John actually wrote the book of Revelation. So it's probably not those. But there's a second list, and that would be the Roman kings from Nero, the seventh one being Domitian, um, because Domitian was a ruler that when John wrote Revelation in AD 90, he was in power at that time. So some believe it's all about Rome, all about Rome in John's day. Here's the problem with that. When you count the Roman kings, that would indicate an eighth kingdom going to verse 11 in your list over there will be a revived Roman empire, and the eighth king would be the Antichrist at some point in the future. And what makes this confusing is the length of time from when John finished the book writing of the book of Revelations to today, the gap uh, is hard to close. So that's scenario number one. Okay, pause. Here's scenario number two. In the Old Testament, mountains often symbolize human kings or kingdoms as well as strength. And we've found multiple connections in Daniel as we've studied the book of Revelation, and it can help us here as well. So if I go back to Daniel 7, there was, in Jan Daniel chapter 7, it talks about uh, seven heads of four beasts. And we can assume that that depiction in, ch in chapter seven has a connection to the harlot beast that we're talking about here. And Daniel, the four beasts, correspond to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And if you recall Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it was depicted of a head of gold, shoulders of silver, torso of bronze, and legs of iron. And these actually represented kingdoms, four kingdoms, the, leg of, the legs of iron being the fourth kingdom. Those kingdoms begin with Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and finally the Roman are those four kingdoms. And so the fifth kingdom, the feet, 
uh, which is mixture of iron and clay, will arise out of the fourth kingdom, the legs, the Roman Empire. But since clay is weak in structure, then that mixture says that the fifth kingdom, the fifth Roman kingdom, will not be as strong as the former Roman kingdom. Okay, that's scenario two. What's the problem with that? So there really is a disconnect between the centuries needed and Daniel and, and the story of Daniel and the relatively short time frame that we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 17. So there's a gap. And even the reason I'm describing these other two is because the final scenario is going to pull on a couple of threads here to tie them together. So I'm given there's a reason why I'm doing it this way. With a pause, here's solution number three. So the Old Testament and the New Testament, when you just read the Bible, it stays focused on, it's focused on the Middle East and it's focused on Jerusalem as the center of the Middle East. So we have this beast with seven heads and 10 horns. These seven heads, they represent governments or kingdoms or empires. Verse nine actually talks about seven heads representing seven kings, humans, real kings. So does it mean that we have to match a kingdom with one particular king? Well, keep this in mind that kingdoms oftentimes lasted for centuries. So they would have multiple kings. So when we go back and look at verses seven through nine um, in, in the scriptures there, it essentially tells us that the seven heads represent both kingdom and king. If we go back to Revelation 13, one of the seven heads, if you remember, had a fatal wound, but actually survived that fatal wound. So this tells us that the seven heads have some independence, indicating that seven heads can be seven unique individuals. Well, the problem with this is that it really causes your head to hurt because it greatly increases the complexity and the untangling of what this prophecy is. It makes it much more complicated. Okay, so finally, the fourth solution. All right, hear me out here. Let's see if I can explain this well. So if I go back to verses 10 and 11, that's on your screen, we're ultimately trying to figure out the eight kingdoms. The seventh and eighth kingdom are the hard ones to figure out. The first five, the ones that are fallen, and these are assuming kingdoms and not kings, would be the Egyptian, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, and then the Greek kingdom. And that ties directly into the second solution that I gave you earlier. So if there's a connection to that. So we have five kingdoms, those kingdoms that I just met, mentioned. Now about the sixth kingdom. The sixth kingdom, John says, is the one that exists now. So in John's time, that can only be wrong. Okay, so we now have six kingdoms identified. So the sixth kingdom, all about Rome, is the solution one that I talked about before. What of the seventh, the kingdom that is yet to come? So note that the eighth is going to come from the seventh. Now, a little bit about history. So a historical theme is that when we see the succession of empires, that the conquering empire is absorbed by the one that's conquering. So the one that's being conquered is being absorbed by the ones conquering. That makes sense. I'm a conquering empire. I'm going to conquer the one that I'm going after. So typically what would happen is the size of the territory of the empire that's doing the conquering, it actually grows because it's now conquered an additional empire. It's obtained some additional land. So as Rome was the sixth empire in John's day, the who conquered the Roman Empire. What is the seventh kingdom? A little bit more of a history lesson. So a sort of a two-step process takes place. So way back in the third century, so this had been a couple hundred years after John wrote the book of Revelation, the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire that existed was divided in two. It had grown so large and it was really unwieldy to operate it actually got divided into Western and Eastern parts, the Ro Roman Empire. This actually happened. Then later, the Western Empire, that actually fell, but the Eastern Empire actually continued on. 
The eastern part of the empire was called the Byzantine Empire. Its capital was Byzantium, which today is actually Istanbul, Turkey. Okay. So about 1100 years later, in the mid 1400s, the Eastern Roman Empire was taken over by the Turks and by Islam. And this was the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire now, which has now the Eastern Roman Empire, absorbed much of what the earlier empires controlled. And of course, that was this, the region of interest was in the Middle East and the areas that surrounded the Mediterranean Sea. That was the, where the empire was predominantly focused. So the Ottoman Empire, this Islamic empire, lasted until the early 1900s. And actually, a little bit of a sidebar, that history actually is a chief instigator in Muslim claims that for much of for for Europe and and the area around the Mediterranean and the Middle East that includes present day Jerusalem that's why there's such a claim on wanting to throw Jerusalem out in the sea because they believe it's actually part of what the empire was that lasted until the 1900s so the claim here is that the seventh kingdom now is or empire is actually the ottoman empire okay so what's the implications of that well, there is a little bit of problem, and it goes back to verse 10, and it talks about this short time, having authority for an hour as kings with the beast. So it's hard to reconcile uh, that piece of it. And so how long is a little while? I don't know how long a little while is. But if this is true, then the seventh kingdom is this Islamic Ottoman Empire. Then it says that we can expect the eighth kingdom, and this is the kingdom that the Antichrist comes from, the time frame that we're in now, to have a commonality with the, the Ottoman Empire. And this actual scenario in this story kind of fits the current events we have today. So for those scenarios, I tend to lean more here um, than the other four, but I'm going to take a breath. I hope that came across at least reasonably okay. Any comments about that? Now, several weeks ago, we actually had this discussion about the 10, the what where the 10 uh, uh, leaders or entities would, would come from. And we talked about the European Union. I think it was actually Jasmine, if I remember correctly, she actually suggested you know, a Muslim influence that potentially that could be where the source of the 10 was. And it just turns out that this particular scenario, you know, ties into that discussion we had uh, several weeks ago. Another another possibility of the 10 could be um, the United Nations Permanent Security Council, which is only five right now, but mm. there's been a lot of discussion the last oh, 15, 20 years to increase that to seven, nine, or 10. But if the, uh, if the United Nations Permanent Security Council became 10 members, that would be interesting, shall that we? That sure would be. Uh, and actually, that, that helps a dilemma that I have in my head, because when we look at the EU right now, because for years and years, it was thought, you know, that the EU started as 10. It's much greater than now. It seemed like an interesting artifact when England backed out of it, you know, would there be more, more backed out? But the Security Council is interesting because of its power and influence it really has on the global stage. That's that's intriguing. Isn't the United States on the uh, Security Council? Yes. Yes. So yeah. when <clears throat> I mean. I feel like most people kind of say that the United States is not really in end times prophecy. So <laughs> I'm not sure about that interpretation. It would be interesting though, if it went to 10. No, I agree. And I would agree that most interpretations I've read on ed end times, we're always trying to find a home for the United States. You have to look hard to find a home for the United States. You know, it doesn't seem to be in there. Um, and it even goes back to the whole Bible is written about, it's all about the Middle East. Um, but again, I won't be dogmatic about that. But like y'all are bringing up, there's a lot, a lot of different interpretations of what this means. And we just have to be mindful that if it happens to happen 
and uh, tomorrow that we have to actually be mindful of what's actually happening and not to discount it because it doesn't meet our particular interpretation of what we think the book of Revelation says. Um, a possible alternate, um, instead of <coughs> the Ottomans, would that be po would that possibly be Genghis Khan? Because his empire, he, he stretched all the way to Europe from Mongolia, and he, it really didn't survive much past his lifetime. Mm. Oh. oh. Short-lived. Uh, another possibility would be Charlemagne um, covered covered quite a bit of Western Europe, Central Europe, and did not uh, last beyond his lifetime either. It's amazing. Yes. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Well. Um, as we move on to, uh, to verses, uh, let's see, almost out of time. If we can run just a couple minutes late, we can go on and finish this chapter. If, if who's taken verses um, 16 through 18? Got them. The beast and the ten horns use, do we read 15? Uh, I th think so. Okay. No, I am skipped it. That's my oh. bad. All right. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Mm, the, beast and, the beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. In my mind, I'm hearing Tim Hawkins read this. That's why I'm chuckling. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. He's the comedian, right? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He does this whole routine about Oh, I, I can't even do it justice. But yeah, where he does in a dramatic voice. So he would Send be like... Send me the link to that, Susan. I'd like I to know. hear that because I like to Hawkins. It would be like the beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. I mean, real dramatic. It wasn't this exact scripture, but it was something like that. Sorry, go ahead and finish. I'm sorry. Okay, just to finish that sidebar, if anyone doesn't know who Tim Hawkins is, you really do need to look him up. He is wicked funny. Um, very, very, and a talented musician as well. But okay, enough of that. Um, what we do, what Susan did read though, is we see the tide, the channel has has changed pretty dramatically because basically what we're learning here is the Antichrist isn't going to tolerate anyone um, except himself. So this son of perdition, you know, who, you know, opposes and exalts himself about all that is called God or that is worship. You know, he's sitting there and he's going to burn her with fire. And once once the the Antichrist power has been consolidated, Antichrist is no longer in need of this religious Babylon uh, harlot. So he's going to then work to dismantle and destroy her and this one world religion because it served his purpose. And we also know that even through history, we see this this um, this goal of tyrants or or, or, or uh, politicians or world leaders will actually use religion for their purpose. And then once the purpose has been done, then it gets discarded. If I go back to verse 15, we learn that the waters where the woman is sitting, you know, basically symbolically represents all of humanity. And we're told that the 10 horns of the beast, these 10 kings are going to actually turn against the woman, uh, this harlot, um, and this wicked world system and bring her to, to ruin. The scripture says it's going to leave her naked, which means to shame her. It's going to eat her flesh, which means to take what she's owned. Uh, it's going to consume her with fire, which means to utterly destroy her. And so just pause and reflect on this. If these, you know, these 10 kings were part and parcel of this 
wicked world system, however it actually shows itself, you know, like the wealthiest and most powerful nations, the Security Council of the UN, um, the whatever that turns out to be, then why would they destroy this very world system that's bringing their world power? Uh, because Satan is actually done with them. They're not part of the end solution that Satan is actually looking, the Antichrist, I should say, is actually looking for. And in verse 17, we saw now an interesting twist here where God is actually directed the judgment against religious Babylon. It says, for God has put into their hearts, God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So here we see God directing the judgment against this religious Babylon. And so God and the scriptures will sometimes actually use a wicked group. In this particular case, it's the 10 kings who will be an instrument of his judgment against another wicked group and here it's the, the religious Babylon. So what is the substitute worldview the 10 kings are going to promulgate after they destroy the prostitute? They're going to have to promulgate some new vision of, of, a, of a worldview on earth to replace her it's basically replacing one bad vision for another. I mean, her bad vision is false religion of sexual immorality and drunkenness. What What is the other bad vision that the 10 guys are going to replace it with? You know, obviously a, a great question that we can't find in, in chapter 23 in Revelation. But, you know, if you think about this for just a minute and look at where we're at today, as an example, you know, we see uh, religion most religions are, are diminishing and being replaced by, you know, a, a, a secular worldview, or it's all about wealth and money and prosperity and doing things. We even saw, I think, earlier in the book of Revelation about, you know, these, these enticements that uh, have been given, you know, to others to try to entice them. So I'm not sure if there's actually a new religion, um, but we already have the mark of the beast at this time. So commerce is now under control, right? And so how can you continue to raise the bar on that? Because now you, the, these people are now vowed to worship uh, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. They're vowed to worship them. And so you would think that there's going to be let things in place to be able to do that. I think that was a multi-worded answer that didn't say much, Nina. But we talk a lot about the swinging of the pendulum, right? And she's yes. described as a harlot, as drunken. The other side is severe austerity, fascism, you know, that kind of ultra strict concept. Yeah. Yep. Well, to finish this off here, you know, he finishes off in verse 18, he talks about that great city. And so, you know, in John's day, there's no doubt which city reigns over the kings of the earth. And that was Rome. Uh, but here we're describing this new, this new makeup of, of these 10, of the, the heads of, of the beasts um, of, of Babylon, uh, this great world sy uh, system that's going to reign over the king of the earth. I think Nina asked a great question is that when the harlot is gone away with, what fills the void? Scripture doesn't say. Um, but there is a question for us as Christians, and that is, you know, when we think about the world even that we live in today, we have to ask the question that Galatians 4, 26 asks, is, does it reign over me? Uh, or am I a citizen of a better city, the Jerusalem above? Where is my focus? Is my focus on, on heaven or is my focus on, on earth and what's happening, what's happening here? And so, you know, next week we're going to find out and learn about the other side of Babylon, the commercial side. Uh, so stay tuned for part two uh, of Babylon. And on that cheery note. <laughs> yeah, it's great, isn't it? Gosh. Well, you know, we have to get through 17 and 18. The 19 gets. Yeah, OK, we're getting there. We're getting there. 
Uh, any any comments at all before? Let's see, maybe I can do that. Let me try this real quick. I want him to share something when everybody's done. <laughs> but if everybody doesn't want to stay, you don't have to. But I found the thing that was making me chuckle. Okay. Wait, a minute, is that is that what uh, Ashley sent in the link? No, it's I didn't send you a link, but I can. Yeah, send me the link in the chat box. Okay. I, I want to hear it, Susan. Yeah, it's really funny, but we can close in prayer first and just <coughs> people don't want to stay. All right, so since you distracted us with giggles, why don't you close us in prayer tonight? I can do that, and I can also send the link. Hold on. Okay. All right. Father God, thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for our friends here on Zoom, Lord, and that we can just study your word together. Um, you're amazing, Lord. We just love you and we praise your holy name. Lord, I ask for special blessings for each one here, for their friends, their family, any prayer needs that they have on their mind. Lord, I thank you that you're a God that knows them even before they roll off our lips. We love you and we praise your holy name. Amen. 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 Okay, right, so, so that's the, what you sent me. Yes, yeah, so I sent him the link to the one that was on my mind when I was reading, what I was hearing, and it was... Um, a bedtime prayer. Go ahead and skip that. Share the screen. All right. so it's only one it. minute and 10 seconds. So let me share my screen and find the right one. <laughs> you don't have to stay on if you don't want, but I think it's funny. <laughs> Can you see the screen yet? Um, it says started sharing, but I can't see the, there it is. Okay, okay. now enlarge it. All right, so I'm going to enlarge it. Let's see. Yep, that, no, no, that one. And Can you still see it? Um, it's coming. Yeah. It is gone. So no, unshare it. Make it like. All right, we're going to do that. And we're going to share it one more time, but not the full screen view. Okay. So one more time. Where'd it go? 